Well, Nationals MP David Gillespie, who represents the electorate of Lyon, has rejected the government's dairy plan, saying it's not the answer to return dairy to profitability. The government plans to give more power to processes if the Australian dairy plan is given the green light. The MP was also unsuccessful in his bid to become deputy leader of the National Party, and we'll talk to him about that. Uh, but he does have the opportunity still to remain on the cards. David Gillespie joins me now from our Canberra studio. David, uh, if we could just Hi talk there. about dairy first up. Yeah, if we could just talk about dairy yeah, well, first, first up. Now, yeah. there's... Yeah, go ahead. Uh, just to correct the record, the Australian Dairy Plan, it's got Australia in front of it, but it's not a government plan, Peter. It's been put together uh, by industry groups, uh, processor groups. Dairy, is, uh, dairy Australia is a, is a government-funded organisation, so I suppose you can say it's got uh, government body involvement, but it's not a parliamentary uh, departmental policy. Uh, and my comments uh, are echoed loud and clear by uh, grower you know, producers themselves, uh, there are some problems sure. with it. Putting the research and development and general promotional vehicle that accepts all the dairy levies um, in charge of negotiations for the industry uh, when there are many people proposed to be on it that are very heavily involved in processing, it just entrenches the disconnect that most farmers have had with uh, the processing industry. David, are I'm you concerned that the ACCC... Yeah. Are you concerned that the ACCC seem to be green-lighting this Chinese takeover of eff effectively the company Dairy Farmers? Well, uh, the ACCC looks at things and uh, assesses whether it will reduce competition. Uh, that is their role. Uh, the FERB is the body uh, foreign investment review board would look at uh, foreign takeover of any any uh, large uh, corporations in australia but look the investment in dairy is welcome whether it's from china from holland from england uh, the biggest dairy uh, holding in tasmania for years was owned by a new zealand local government um, a super fund uh, and before that, uh, UK interests. So having uh, mm. foreign investment is the important thing because it's investment. And the investment dollars land here and the expansion of dairy is what we're all about. Uh, and because of the difficulties and the pricing structures uh, in the fresh milk market, we've had a massive exit of producers. Um, and we want to get people back into the industry and have it growing. And at the root of that, is a fair farm grade price. As I observed um, in my comments to uh, the Weekly Times, uh, export uh, industry prices are delivering farm gate prices that are absolutely uh, record high in many areas of the export market, but the domestic fresh milk uh, price isn't supporting a price that's keeping people uh, in the business, let alone profitable. And that's where we need to uh, make our changes. We are legislators and regulators. The Dairy Code of Conduct is now mandatory uh, and all contracts between producers and processors will have to be uh, Dairy Code compliant by the end of the year. That's going to enable massive changes and there's also another initiative, the Australian Milk Pricing Initiative, which is setting up the contract structure so that uh, dairy uh, farmers uh, can sell onto a market structure and have um, sales to second and third parties besides their initial and their uh, processing uh, company that is picking up their milk. So that will be a great uh, initiative. It will mean that farmers aren't stuck with one customer uh, for years or more at a time. So between the Code of Conduct and the Milk Pricing Initiative, we should see a much better market uh, for selling milk and a better deal for farmers. David can't come soon enough. Sure. The, they, yeah, exactly. All right. Now, bushfires. 37 homes destroyed yes. in your electorate of line. Now, Infrastructure Australia has today identified that one of the areas of major concern now as a result of the devastation is the lack of telecommunications, uh, you know, phone coverage, all that sort of thing. And they're saying that needs to be a, a big priority. Um, it's something you've spoken about in the past, isn't it? 
Yeah, look, uh, in my electorate there are actually more than that, Peter. It's about 150 houses that were either destroyed or burned. I think those 37 figures were for the part of the uh, line electorate in the Hastings Port Macquarie, but in Mid Coast Council it was a massive um, uh, crisis. We had fires west, south and north from Taree and uh, 240,000 hectares in the end. So look, at it, but we were fortunate in, in one regard they happened in November when it wasn't as hot and we had all those wonderful people concentrated in one area rather than what rolled out subsequently with uh, you know, huge fires in South Australia and Kangaroo Island uh, and down the south coast and into Victoria. So we're ahead of the curve in the recovery space uh, and that's what we're focusing on, getting things going again. Now the telecommunications was a problem for us because the fires, just the heat blew the fuses in a lot of these mobile phone areas, uh, let alone actually mm. destroying towers or exchanges. Uh, because of the fires, maintenance of the exchanges was delayed and the battery backup or the diesel backup ran out. So a lot of people were in the dark, literally, uh, for weeks and up to more than um, six or eight weeks, and that wasn't satisfactory. Uh, the telcos have stepped up to the mark. Uh, I've been beating the drum with them for November and December, and most people are... Uh, in a telecommunications back to normal situation. There's isolated places where it's not, but the problems down south were um, the same problems again. Once the fires come, a satellite, fire, a satellite phone doesn't even work. Towers are down, exchanges are down, uh, landlines are down, and it's really difficult. Um, and it puts a lot of stress on people under huge stress. David, I know you've copped a bit of flack uh, from these climate change evangelists who often protest outside of your office, but when we have a look at this commission of inquiry into the bushfires, it's not a binary yes. argument, is it? I mean, you know, we, we know that climate change is, is having an effect on the way in which uh, <clears throat> these bushfires uh, happen, but the backburning and the mitigation measures that we've... Uh, done so well in the past, we've clearly dropped the ball on that. How important is it that this particular uh, inquiry ensure that we look at those backburning measures? Yeah, exactly. Well, backburning is part of um, actually fighting a fire, um, where you turn a fire back on a fire to stop it in its tracks. Uh, but hazard reduction burning. Um, was a practice that Aboriginals have done for thousands of years. Our early settlers mm. copied them, our early farmers copied them, and state forests who used to manage millions of these acres that are burnt, uh, at least in New South Wales, were turned into state forests, or uh, state forests were turned into national parks or state conservation areas. And a lot of those hazard reduction burns that were done biannually or every three years meant you had a low level cool burn that cleaned out the, um, the floor of the forest uh, as well as encouraging flora diversity. These low level burns didn't kill hundreds of thousands of animals and didn't destroy really good timber stands. Uh, also the forests uh, by their very nature were harvested every 20 or 30 years so they were thinned out naturally and that encouraged regrowth and, and flora and fauna diversity. Now a lot of these practices were put by the wayside when uh, national parks took over, a lot of the forest trails were closed, uh, the uh, fire access to fight anything was uh, locked off and it's been a cause of great public ill-conceived policy because all the foresters that surround the area that I live in uh, were used to doing these low-level control burns. Local fire um, RFS uh, crews were used to doing it without all the regulation and red tape. It was all controlled locally, done frequently, so you didn't have these huge burns where once you get about more than five tonnes of debris on the bottom of a eucalyptus forest floor and you get a fire in it. It's not a low level burn anymore. It goes up into the canopy, you get the eucalyptus oil exploding, the winds th uh, fly it through the canopy and it's almost impossible to stop. 
and all these old hands have been telling me in my electorate that sure, climate change is here, but what is also here and has been here for 30 years or so is uh, native vegetation and land management practices have changed the situation. And that's why we've had these huge fires, uh, just as much as the drought dried everything out, huge fuel loads, either um, lightning strike or unfortunately down around Canberra, you know, the heat from uh, lights on a helicopter, start a fire and there's so much fuel there, it just gets away and we have had the disaster we have. And look, we were uh, launching a House Standing Committee inquiry into the regulations and the legislative changes in land management and the effect on the intensity and frequency of bushfires. We've received lots of really good information uh, from many sources, but now that we have a larger Royal Commission, all that information is going to be rolled into the Royal Commission. I'm disappointed, but we were just going to have too many inquiries running at the one time, uh, and the priority is the Royal Commission. So we'll get all that information analysed, because it is an issue that has to be uh, looked at. Now, the Royal Commission's got a different set of terms of references, um, and we're looking at the coordination and how the federal government should get involved uh, and under what terms, because during the emergency, everyone was calling for the federal government to be involved, but the way the federation mm. works, we have to be invited by the states, and that's what not a lot of people mm. appreciated. So that's one of the focuses, and improving our preparedness and resilience for national disasters is sure. the other uh, focus of it, and that will involve preparedness and regular um, low-level cool climate burns uh, on a widespread scale uh, with increasing frequency if we're going to return to the days where we didn't have these huge ones like we've had recently. Well, David Gillespie, thank you so much uh, for joining us tonight uh, on Sky News Across Australia. I really appreciate it. My pleasure, Peter.